Well, hi there. You're walking in the woods. There's no one around, and your phone is dead. Out of the corner of your eye, you spot him. Dave Kaufman. He's following you about 30 feet back. He gets down on all fours and breaks into a sprint. He's gaining on you. Dave Kaufman. You're looking for an escape. There's a river in front of you. He's almost upon you now, and you can see there's hair on his face. My gosh, there's hair everywhere. But wait, you're not caught yet. Dave, surprise, you run across the top of the water, leaving Kaufman behind. You fall on your knees and catch your breath. You're finally safe from Dave Kaufman. Impossible? Well, that really depends. Not if you're the basilisk lizard Dave and I found during our most recent trip to Florida. Basilisks are notorious for their ability to run across water. And thanks to Dave, I was blessed to see this ability in person. But there's a lot more to love about these guys than just that. Mostly, they're super cool looking. The color, the ornamentation, especially on the males like this one, who belongs to my good friend Matt Jepson, who keeps these and breeds these. They remind me of sailfin dragons, but more reasonably sized and arguably more beautiful. But you might have noticed that we don't have a category for beauty or for rat ability to run across polar molecules. So, is the green basilisk a good pet? And is it the best pet lizard for you? To figure that out, we'll have to give it a score based on our actual five categories, which are handleability, care, hardiness, availability, and upfront costs. When it comes to handleability, we give the basilisk a score of three out of five. You'd think that a nervous lizard that can run on two legs fast enough that it can glide across the surface of water would be a dream to handle, but they often are not. Wild-caught individuals can be particularly nervous, but captive-bred individuals can be much more relaxed if properly socialized. That's key. We have a full video featuring Kevin McCurley that is full of incredible insight with regard to socializing reptiles. Generally, basilisks can be handled for as long as they can be lightly restrained, which is what I'm having to do right now. But most will never be as easy to handle as, say, like a bearded dragon or a blue tongue. Just never, ever. Their main defense is to run like the wind. However, they are a reasonably large iguanid lizard, so they can bite and do some damage. And those claws? They're sharp. They aren't gonna do too much damage, but they can do some. Uh, they can tail whip and can potentially drop the tail, but those aren't major concerns like they would be for an iguana or a crested gecko. In short, they can be handled but that probably isn't one of their best features. When it comes to care, we give the basilisk a score of two out of five. In a lot of ways, these guys are kind of like American water dragons. And uh, Chinese water dragons got a score of two out of five. There really aren't many considerable differences. Like Chinese water dragons, imports are often in poor condition and often die within a few months. Captive bread is definitely the way to go. Like water dragons, they should have access to large amounts of clean water. This means you'll need to probably have filtration in most cases. This is also a lizard that is nervous and can move very quickly. Uh, small enclosures are not a good idea. They will just be running into the walls, grinding off their faces. Not a good plan. Give them lots of space to run, climb, and hide. This means that the enclosure should primarily favor floor space, though Again, a lot of height also because they will climb. If you want any chance at being able to handle this lizard, be sure that the enclosure opens for the front so you aren't an eagle every time you go to pick them up. In addition to a large pond area, they also need relatively high humidity. Uh, they'll be sure that there's adequate ventilation so the air isn't stagnant. Uh, for this reason, PVC or other plastic enclosures will probably be better than glass, especially if that has a screen lid. Uh, also, like Chinese water dragons, they struggle to comprehend transparent barriers. So, as I mentioned before, in small enclosures, they're prone to nose rubbing. Opaque sides and space are the answer to this problem. Provide UVA and UVB. UVB is particularly important for these guys, especially if you want them to show their best color. You've probably seen how much more spectacular these generally look in the wild than in captivity. Well, UVB is a big part of that. The other part is nutrition. When it comes to feeding, offer a wide diversity of foods and calcium and vitamin dusting on any sort of insects or other food is, is really, really critical. Also add a diversity of fruits and veggies into that diet. Imports are going to be a lot more likely to be picky eaters as well. You know the solution. Captive bread. 
And here is Matt Jepson to talk a little bit more about the care of these animals because he keeps and breeds them and has some of the most spectacular looking basilisks I've ever seen in person. Well, as usual, Clint covered care pretty well and pretty thoroughly. I, I'll just mention a few things that are kind of nuances, experiences that I've had or things that I've learned through raising these. I actually observed quite a few of these in the wild before I ever had one as a pet. And that was what spurred my desire to, to raise them and to try to breed them. Saw in the wild how the, the greens are just truly emerald, right? That was, that's one of the common names that they're known by and really bright colors. How the crests, the sails just seem to keep growing. And, and you know, some individuals in the wild, you'll see sails that are over two inches tall, uh, approaching three inches tall. And I looked and saw that what you typically see in the wild, even in zoos, were very small sails, faded green coloration, even on animals that looked like they were of a healthy weight. They just didn't have that, that vibrance. And you see that same look in uh, red-eyed tree frogs and, and, and other species that you know have this vibrant green naturally. Uh, so I, I wanted to try to raise them and try to approximate as much as possible that true color and that uh, that sail size. This individual here is only about a year and a half old, so still growing. I've caught individuals in the wild, specimens in the wild, that were certainly twice the body weight, at least, of this animal. Not twice as long, but a, a much bigger animal in some of the male specimen you'd, you'd see out there in, in Costa Rica and Nicaragua. So when I obtained juveniles, I did as much research as I could, and there's not a lot out there in terms of, of proper nutrition, you know, general information that you would follow about nutrition and about UVB, of course, uh, was out there. But there were a few of us that were kind of going along at the same time, and, and there were a couple of individuals I found who had achieved at least a pretty good green color in their animals, and. Uh, their sales continued to grow, and so we, we started exchanging notes. And one of the things that we found is that really st strong UVB uh, was important. And I actually had one juvenile male who got sick for a couple of months and just didn't eat well, and quarantined him, separated him, and uh, you know kept him going. And then he, he bounced back and, and became healthy again, but never quite regained that emerald col coloration. Uh, and we'll see as he grows whether or not that comes back, but it, it does seem to be that you know, kind of that consistency of what I believe is a combination of UVB, proper UVB, and and uh, varied UVB across the spectrum, as well as perhaps beta carotene in the diet. Certainly, proper supplementation of calcium, um, less frequently calcium with vitamin D and then a multivitamin uh, seems to be important. But I, I found that in watching these individuals in their, in their enclosures, that they move from a mercury vapor light to a 10% um, or if closer, 6% uh, fluorescent tube light. They seem to discriminate between these different UVBs and, and, and kind of bounce around uh, throughout the enclosures through the day. And really we've seen that uh, Whatever the combination is, we've been able to retain pretty good, uh, vibrant greens. And that sale is still growing. And uh, I'm hoping to be able to get that sale to something that, that looks like adult male green basilisk in the wild. One other thing I would note is that there are some theories that having male basilisks in sight of each other might keep the sale growing, keep the, the, the development of the hood uh, as well as the sale. I think you have to be careful with that because you don't want to stress the animal. I know some people will use mirrors even, and uh, you know, I, I think that that probably results in undue stress. We do have males in the same room that are removed from each other and they'll display at each other sometimes and don't seem to be too stressed out. And that may contribute as well to that growth. But anyway, just a few, a few notes in terms of the coloration, that, that really the beautiful, both blues, the turquoise and the greens that uh, you see in nature and trying to be able to achieve that in uh, a captive setting. As far as breeding goes, uh, it's really pretty straightforward. A male and a female in the same cage, uh, you'll have eggs pretty quickly as long as the conditions in the cage are, are proper and, and they're getting enough to eat. Um, females 
during the season can can clutch one after another. And um, the females will lay in a six to 12 inch tub in the cage, they'll lay their eggs. It can be um, between six and uh, 10 eggs is what I've experienced that they'll lay. Uh, incubation's pretty pretty easy, pretty straightforward. And the babies babies are pretty hardy from the get-go. When, when they, they come out, you know, obviously humidity is important for them, uh, avoiding stress, but uh, for the most part, they're pretty easy from right out of the egg. Thank you very much, Matt. That insight is really, really critical for anybody considering one of these. So please listen to what he just had to say. As you may know, Matt Jepson has actually been in several of our videos and as cool as he is when it comes to keeping unbelievably rad animals, where his passion really lies is in going herping and finding unbelievably cool creatures all over the world. I would like to follow him on one of these adventures and show you the kind of incredible stuff that he tends to see. And these kinds of things are only possible because of the support of our patrons on Patreon. If you would like to see me go to cool places like Costa Rica or the Amazon or Australia to show you awesome things, maybe that you have seen before and a heck of a lot of things you've never seen before and that I've never seen before and just see how excited I might get about something like that, <laughs> please consider supporting us on Patreon. We've also got a lot of rad features to try to pay you back for all that you do for us. When it comes to hardiness, we give the basilisk a score of two out of five. Obviously, this score would be much higher for captive bred individuals. That said, most of them that you'll see, at least, uh, it seems to be transitioning, but you know, in, in the recent past, almost all of them that you'd see would be wild caught. But now, there are getting to be more captive bred available. That said, if you get an import, I'll be impressed if it's still alive in a year. This is a high-strung lizard that just doesn't always do well with the stresses of importation. Not to mention their parasite load. And again, there's a solution. Just get one that's captive bred. These aren't really all that difficult to breed in captivity, but there aren't that many people that want to put in the time, space, and expense that it takes to breed these amazing lizards just to compete with $15 imports. Of course, a $100 alive lizard is worth a lot more than a $15 dead one, in my opinion. When it comes to availability, we give the basilisk a score of three out of five. You will see imports at pet stores and expos, but not all the time. And that's fine by me because you don't want one of those anyway. You want to go to somebody like Matt. They won't be available at all times, but if you want one at some point this year, you should be able to get a captive bred baby from one of these amazing breeders. When it comes to upfront costs, we give the basilisk a score of three out of five. Even captive bred babies are very reasonably priced. That's often the case when breeders have to compete with imports. Pay what they're asking. Captive bred is just much better. It's better for you as they're much nicer and more likely to survive, and it's much better for the wild population, not to mention the animals that came here as imports that will probably die within the next year. The enclosure that you'll need should be large, both in terms of floor, space, and height. And this won't be cheap, but it is at least something you could probably buy commercially. Places like Toad Ranch might be a really good place to check out. Um, also, Zen Habitats, they've got some really great enclosures, just depending on how much humidity you need to maintain. If you have a large water feature, which is a very good idea with these guys, you might need some filtration on that, or at least plan to do regular water changes. You're gonna need heat and a variety of different kinds of UVB lamps, just high amounts of UV all over the enclosure with just small refuges from that UV seems to be the way to go. Matt told you all about that before. Make sure you have a substrate that can get wet without molding and also sticks and other features in the enclosure, just all of those things that they won't mold on you. And this is why overall we give the basilisk a score of 2.6 out of 5. As we transition to captive bred, they're going to be better, but this isn't a very handleable animal and it needs a lot of space and, you know, proper care. If what you want is a beautiful piece of hydroplaning eye candy, then the green basilisk might be the perfect pet lizard for you. As always, like and subscribe, and we hope to see you real soon. Thank you, Matt. Oh, thanks a lot, Matt. <laughs> That's about right. I don't <laughs> Close your mouth. Yeah, we're having a good experience, aren't we? Just like it. No, it doesn't. <laughs>
He's being good though. He's still nervous in his breathing. Yeah, he's, he's like, man, this guy's taking forever to eat me. I thought this would be over by now. <laughs>